Algebra practice. Solving for exponents in the denominator. In this video, we're going to cover often forgotten about algebraic concepts that you're going to need for Chem 1. These very frequently center around what to do if something is in the denominator and you need to solve for it. This is a problem that comes, comes up especially if you largely learned algebra via tricks and shortcuts that are used to get the right answer, but aren't really fully covering the algebra rules. And this is something that our modern school system really likes to do to students. And so we're going to really walk through and practice all of these. So specifically, we're going to work at solving for a denominator. And then we're going to expand that to solving for a denominator with an exponent. And then we're going to expand that to include some complex rearrangements, which require more than one step. And then you're going to probably also want to connect this in with logarithm rules, which we put in another video. Usually people get stuck when solving for an exponent in the denominator, but I actually want us to start a little bit before that and just solve for the denominator um, and so that we can build on this problem. Whenever you learn anything in math and science, you want to be sure that you connect the new thing with the thing that you already know. This is what we call scaffolding, and it is a fundamental way that you learn effectively anything. From your first words being built upon your first baby dinosaur screech to the complex math and science that you are one day going to use for your careers. Depending on what school and year that you took algebra, you may have learned to do this a few different ways. I'm going to do it both ways. In the first, I'm going to use a shortcut trick that works pretty well, but doesn't really show us exactly what is happening. In the second, I'll explain why this process works using a simpler, simpler algebraic concepts of what you do to one side, you've got to do to the other. Either is fine for solving the problem, but it's worth seeing both so that you can use whatever fits your preferences. So in the first one, which I'm calling the shortcut, this is where you may have learned that you can just invert both sides. So you can invert the five to make it one over five, and you can invert the one over x to make it x. Or if it helps, you can think of 1 over x being flipped to x over 1. And then that x over 1 just becomes x. And this would mean that x equals 1 fifth. And that's really handy. Um, the only problem with that is, again, it doesn't really show you exactly what's happening. And because of that, if you're solving more complex problems, you could get a little bit lost when that trick doesn't really work. So let's think about the longer way here. So in the longer way, we're going to use our baseline. What you do to one side, you do to the other. So we'll multiply by x here, and we'll multiply by x here. That gives us 5x equals 1. Now to get the x by itself, we're going to divide by 5, divide by 5, which gets us x equals 1 fifth, which is, of course, what we saw from our shortcut, because the shortcut is just working through this longer way much faster, but it's what we're doing. And then we're going to use this to build all of our other concepts off. Let's add one step to this. This is a very common step that comes up in many places, but specifically in solving quantum mechanical problems. For instance, in these two equations, you'll be seeing quite a bit of in your first couple of weeks in chemistry. Often you'll be solving for n. So you can see where this concept is going to come up. But for now, let's stick with the version I have above, the 5 equals 1 over x squared. Similar to the last time, we'll do this using both the shortcut and doing the example where we show how the shortcut works, because that's often going to be what you need. So for our shortcut, we can invert both sides, giving us 1 over 5 equals x squared over 1. x squared over 1 is, of course, just x squared at which point we can take the square root of both sides to give us 0 0.45. Now let's do this a slightly longer way, where we really walk through exactly what we're doing with the algebra. So first, we can multiply both sides by x squared. This would give us 5x squared equals 1. We can then divide by 5 on both sides to give us x squared equals 1 fifth. We can then take the square root of both sides 
to get us that same value. So the same process, um, in one case, just really working through the algebra, but connecting that back to the shortcut that you may have learned when you had this in some algebra class somewhere. Now, without going into too much of the reasons for why I've picked this large following formula, I'd like us to use this formula. It's something that you're going to see in your chem classes and often trips people up when solving for one of the n values. We're going to do two examples, one solving for the nf and one solving for the ni. For our purposes here, each of the other letters will be represented by a number that I give you. When you get to this in your chemistry classes, you'll learn about what these variables and what these constants are. First, let's just fill in all of our constants. This gives us a place to start solving for numbers. The more numbers that we can get out of the way, the easier it's going to be to figure out how to isolate the variable that we are solving for. Some people may choose to solve for the variable first, and that's totally okay as well. I find people who find algebra to be a bit more of a challenge prefer to minimize the terms though, and solving for numbers is one way to do that. This simplifies a lot by letting us take all of our exponent terms to one. At this point, the easiest way to get rid of some of the complexity is to divide the 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18th over. And also to notice that one over one is equal to one. And that gets our parenthetical term all by itself and simplifies it. So let's do that. Now we need to continue isolating our term with the unknown, in this case, the NF. So let's add a one to both sides. And now we're back to the same problem that we did in the last slide. We have a number on our left and a one over our variable on our right. So we can invert and take the square root, or you can think about it as dividing or multiplying the NF squared on both sides and then dividing the 0.26. Then we take our square root, and we get two. You'll learn why we round this to a whole number when you use this equation to solve for real chemistry problems, as opposed to just using it for illustrating the algebraic concepts. Um, or perhaps you're already there, and that's why you're visiting this video, and you understand. But again, we're sticking to the algebra. Let's do a very, very similar example where we now solve for ni. Though very, very similar, there is enough of a difference that I think it's still worth doing both. This starts out the same. We're gonna fill in our numbers. Then we wanna divide the number out front of the parenthetical over. There's some tricks that would make the algebra a bit simpler here. And if you see these, um, go ahead and go for it but I'm just gonna work through it in the most straightforward possible way, even if that makes it a bit longer. This is what I found most students find easiest to follow and do. So first let's simplify all of our exponents and then divide the negative 2.178 over. From here, we can either solve the one over nine or subtract it over as is. I'm actually gonna subtract it over leaving it as a fraction just to show you how that works. Now we can solve for the value on the left, and we have our value on the right. Notice that there is a negative on both sides. So we would think about doing this as multiplying a negative one on both sides to get rid of the negative, leaving us with 0.25, one over ni squared. And now we're back to that same problem that we were on before we started doing these, what we call Rydberg problems. And so we can multiply our ni squared up. We can divide. We can divide our 0.25 over. And we can see that our ni by taking our square root would be two.
last video, we covered how to solve for an unknown in the denominator of an equation. And then we extended this to unknowns that have an exponent and are in the denominator. And then we integrated this concept into more difficult equations, which require multiple steps to solve. You'll use these algebra concepts throughout all of chemistry. And specifically, we worked with an equation that you're going to very frequently see in quantum mechanics when you hit that in your chemistry courses.